marvel when I think about the universe as it first came from the, ha from the hand of the creator. I imagine one pulse of harmony coursing through the vast creation. From him who created it all flow life, light, and gladness through the realms of illimitable space. All things animate and inanimate in their unshadowed beauty declare the goddess law. I rejoice when I think of these things. But then sin came in the world, and it shattered this harmony. Adam and Eve began to blame each other, and they hid from God. Unity between the, among them and between them and God was broken. As a counteraction, God, in his perfect wisdom, purpose to bring unity to all things on heaven and on earth under Christ. Ephesians 1.19, and to make out of the two, that is Gentiles and Jews, one body. Ephesians 2.15, one body through the cross. In God's theme, this unity was highly prized because he caused the life of his son, Jesus. Jesus, the same one who in his priestly prayer said, I do not pray for these alone, but for those also who will believe in me through their word, that they may be one, just as you, Father, and me are one, that they may be perfect in one, that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Jesus here illustrates the unity of the church as that existing in the Godhead. And I ask you, can you think of a closer, a deeper, a more intimate unity than that which exists among the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? I cannot. And yet that's what is expected of the church. Jesus' prayer will soon come to be fulfilled. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, Jesus is crowned king in the heavenly place, while the apostles are all with one accord in one place. Jesus is anointed with oil on high, while the overflow of his anointment pours down onto the apostles on sight. The apostles began to speak in other tongues, and multitudes of devout men from every nation began to throng. Here, the process, the division of tongues at Babel is reversed, and the process to bring unity to all things in Christ begins. I ask you, is the unity of the body of Christ a sociological phenom phenomena of like-minded people coming together? No, it is not. It was caused by the Holy Spirit himself. The glory to God is that he is able to bring people that in the natural realm will be opposing to each other, such as Simon, the zealot, and Matthew, the tax collector, and to bring them into one family united with genuine love. Pastors, do you think that the church unity is important? God thought so, so in his wisdom he developed the plan. Jesus thought so, so he died for it. The Holy Spirit thought so, so he poured down onto the apostles to bring about this unity. Paul thought so, so he wrote the letter to the Ephesians. While in prison in Rome, around the year 60 to 62 AD, Paul writes this letter exhorting the believers to pursue unity and morality in their common identity, their Christian identity, that is. In the first three chapters, Paul tells them and reminds them of their past alienation from Christ and their present acceptation in Christ. He tells them they were once lost in transgression, but now they are saved through Christ, Christ's redemption. They used to crawl low in the world. Now they stand high for the Lord. They were God's enemies, but now they are God's offspring. Paul did not rush through these truths as some misspelled text message, as we do sometimes, because he understood that it was important for them to own these truths so that they could meet the challenge that will face them ahead. So now, in chapter 4, by the use of the word, therefore, which serves as the hinge pin of this whole letter, Paul moves from the deep theology of redemption to the high calling and exhortation. It's as if he's telling them, 
Now that you have been redeemed, therefore you must live like it. Now that you have been redeemed, chapters 1 to 3, therefore you must live like it, chapters 4 to 6. Therefore, reads the scripture, I, a prisoner in the Lord, urge you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. Walk here has to do with the way of living. And worthy refers to a having word that matches, matches actual value. It's like when you place two things in a balance and they equal out. So did you catch this? Paul is telling them they need to measure up to their call in Christ. Impossible, we will say. This is humanly impossible indeed. So we must recognize that this is a spiritual endeavor. And the fruits of the Spirit must be operative in our lives so that we can fulfill, we can maintain this unity. So here Paul, just as he did in Galatians 5, he describes <coughs> the fruit of the Spirit. Verses, we're in uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 2 and 3. They read, With all humbleness and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Do you notice a common thread here? All these descriptions, all these adjectives can only be exercised in community. And the fourth characteristic that he describes is humbleness, which means lowliness of mind, to think less of yourself. That is because unity cannot grow in an environment of pride. It can only grow where humility in relationships is available. In the Greek and the Roman culture, this was seen as a derogatory trait because it was that of a slave. But yet, for the Christian, it was a primary quality because it was exemplified by Jesus Christ, our Savior himself, who did not come to serve, to be served, that is, but to serve and to give his life for many. The second quality for unity that Paul speaks of is gentleness, which refers to a mild spirit. Gentleness conveys the sensitivity, a desire not to harm, and a valuing of the other person. Brethren, do you think it will be important for us in our relationships at home and the church to see everyone that we relate to as if he had a sign in his forehead that reads, fragile, handle with care. Would that help us relate to each other with gentleness and kindness? The next attitude to maintain the unity of which Paul speaks is that of patience. Now, the Greek word here is macrothemius, which means long suffering. Macro, long, themius, suffering. And in the New Testament, this word is exclusively used of people. Not of events or circumstances, but of people. And our example to follow is that of God himself in the Old Testament. The Bible reads in Exodus 3, 4, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth. So when we get to the point of where we say, I've had it with this person, I am through, the high calling in Christ challenges us to ask ourselves, are we being Long suffering? Have we been slow to anger? <clears throat> the next attitude that Paul gives is bearing with one another in love. And I am glad Paul said this because how goes the false assumption that the church is filled with perfect people? Because perfect people do not need to be endured. But sinners like you and me, we do need to be endured and in love. <laughs> Endure in love. And the verse continues, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And this is a bond of unity strengthened by our common participation in the experience of salvation. You will understand this just now. And Paul wants to make sure that we understand all the things in which we are united. So he utters the following words. And he says, for there is one, one body and one spirit, just as you were also called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. 
Now here, to emphasize this unity, Paul uses the word one seven times. And let me paraphrase what he's talking about. We are members of one body because we are all indwelled by the same one spirit. Just as we are also called in one hope of our calling. And what is that calling? To become members of God's covenant people with the right to inherit the same prom covenant promises. As a result, we are now living under one united kingdom, under one Lord. Because there is only one name under heaven by which we must be saved. Hence, we place our one faith in him. And having publicly acknowledged our faith in him, we become part of his body through one baptism. We are now sons and daughters of the one father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Did you catch this? Paul intended by these words that we'll understand all the things that we have in common <coughs> in the Christian world so that we will remain united. But although the early church was exemplary for their practices of love and unity, we must recognize that from its inception, the church was played by, by dissension. The Corinthians were divided just about everything. There, was, there were divisive Judaizers. They were liberal compromisers. They were contentious fashionizers, taking sides for one or another of the apostles. But even with these issues, they managed to remain united for about a thousand years. Then, in the year 1054, we have the great split, the great schism between the Catholic and the Orthodox Church. And let me ask you, what do you think went wrong? Well, they forgot they had lost sight of the Christian truths in which this unity stood firm. Sadly, they focused in petty differences that kept them apart. Things such as papal claim for dominance. In our case, General Conference kingly powers versus the rebellious princes of the unions disobeying the maximum authority of the church, <coughs> which is the people when they voted. They were fighting about additions to the creeds. Now we have issues with policies elevated to the place of doctrines. They had issues about the celibacy, celibacy of the clergy. Now we have issues about women's ordination. For them, this trumped all the things that united them, and they split, and they remain so until this day. We're in a very fragile condition. I don't know if you can notice this. We must act tactfully. Fast forward 800 years. The Seventh-day Adventist Church was born to, upheld, to uphold the faith that was once delivered to the saints. The baton of the gospel is in our hand. We are one body. And yet the reality of our unity is often obscure at the practical level because of disagreement, disharmony, discord, and dissension that bring this unity in the body. And this happens at both the personal, the local, and the global level. But instead, we should, brethren, we should be the kind of people that are humble and gentle, that are not resentful, people that do not keep a list of the wrongs of other people to go and get them back later. In the church, let's be the kind of people that understand that Christ died for this unity. A kind of people that values our common experience above our differences. So that even when the time of division that we have in our nation comes, they will look at us and they will say, I want what they have. Look at those people. I miss their disagreements. In spite of their disagreements, they got it together. They remain together with humbleness, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another in love. Wouldn't that be an awesome thing that the world will look at us at this time? For you see, from the time of the fall until the present, humanity has attempted to be united. <coughs> but they have failed to do so. One of the closest attempts occurred with, recently with the experiment of the United States of America. 
Now, if you look at the $1 bill that you have with you on the back of that dollar bill, the seal of the United States, there are 13 stripes representing the initial 13 colonies bonding together. And they later became the United States of America, United States of America. In that seal, there is an eagle holding a band, and that band has a motto, and the motto says, e pluribum unum, out of many, one. That motto certainly is being tested these days. One very graphic way to depict this is as we look at the map of America with the division of red and blue states. Now, the divisions that we have in this nation are deep. They're all at the level of worldviews. And at times, they may, be even be, they may even be irreconcilable. Today, the divisions that are racking this nation may possibly lead us to descend into a situation of bickering and volcanization that will make it very difficult to live in this nation. But whatever happens, whether our political system or the people can bridge that gap and punch them together, we, the church, should not adapt the spirit of the age. Lest we descend into bickering, disunity, and division. God's remnant church cannot, I repeat, cannot afford to be torn apart by the very people for whom Christ died, the very people he put together in one body. Pastors, as we deal with the issues in our church, we will do well to heed Paul's words of urgent advice. So as we close, please let us read, read together from Philippians 2, verse 1 to 4. Everybody's there? <clears throat> Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit, one in mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interest, but each of you, to the interest of others. Let us pray. May God the Father, creator of our unity, may Jesus Christ, the propitiator of our unity, and may the Holy Spirit, sustainer of our unity, abide in our life, that we may remain united until his soon return. In the name of Jesus, amen.